very happy to introduce Christian Rosendahl, uh, who will uh, speak about groups with bounded geometry. Okay, uh, well, thank you, Anush, and thanks uh, to the ESL for inviting me to speak. Um, well, so I'm speaking here from Washington, where I'm temporarily at the National Science Foundation, so I should start by putting a disclaimer. Let's see, is this? Okay, there. All right, that uh, though nothing is really controversial of what I'm going to say anyway. Um, good, so uh, what I'm going to talk about today are groups of uh, bounded geometry. Uh, this is part of a sort of a larger project on uh, geometric group theory for uh, a larger class of uh, topological groups than uh, those for which it's uh, finite, uh, or sort of usually studied. Okay, so I'll start by uh, just having a brief uh, detour through uh, geometric group theory and say what it's about. Also, um, of course, abstract groups. So by abstract groups, I just mean the groups that you learn about in the first cl class in uh, group theory. It's just uh, sets with a, a certain multiplication. Okay, so these are discrete algebraic object, objects, but uh, one of the uh, sort of the central tenets of infinite group theory is that uh, they may and should success, uh, they may successfully uh, be studied through a geometric lens. Okay, then not just purely algebraic objects. And uh, this has sort of been very prevalent the last uh, 40, 50 years. Okay, so for example, if you take a finitely generated group, you uh, it's naturally equipped with its word metric or its word metrics and which render the metric spaces and thus amenable to uh, geometric analysis. Okay. So how uh, is this done? Well, so specifically, suppose you have a group and you fix a finite generating set S for this group. So just any subset so that any element of G can be written as a product of uh, uh, elements of uh, these generators. Okay, and then you define a left invariant metric on the group, or invariant on the multiplication on the left, it's called the word metric. So how is this done? This is done via the formula here. So the distance from one group element X to another group element Y is just the minimum number of uh, generators you need to multiply Y or X with on the right to get to Y. Okay, this is an uh, easy definition. And of course, uh, this word metric that depends on the generating sets in us is uh, nothing else than the shortest pass, path distance in the associated Cayley graph. Uh, right, so let's take a specific example here. Fairly standard example, namely, uh, the free group, free non-abelian group on generators A and B. So two generated uh, uh, non-abelian free group. And you take S to be this uh, set of uh, generators A and B. Okay, then you draw a graph on the group by connecting two group elements if they differ uh, by an element of S on the right. Okay. In this case, since it's a free group, we just get a tree here depicting this uh, graph. And the word metric is just the shortest path distance in uh, the resulting graph. OK, so this is uh, straightforward. Now, on the face of it, uh, the word metric and thus the associated geometry of uh, the on, of the of the given metric space is dependent on this the presentation of the group, so meaning the specific choice of generating set. And now, if you have a 
finitely generated group, there's no canonical choice in any way of choosing the generating set. And I think this is a, a result of uh, Simon Thomas that there's no Borel way of choosing uh, the, the generating set. Okay, but this is uh, a mild dependence. Uh, the, the, the metric depends on the generating set, but this dependence is mild in the following sense that if you take two uh, different finite generating sets for a finitely generated group, these two uh, word metrics are quasi-isometric. So that is that for it, there are some constants depending on uh, the choice of generating sets, K and C, so that these uh, word metrics are bounded finely in each other. In fact, you can even get rid of the C here since you're dealing with discrete groups, but I'll keep the C around. So there's an affine bound of the, uh, of the two metrics. Okay. So here's a, again, a typical example that you first take the, the integers and you pick uh, the standard generating set, which is just uh, the single element one. Well, then uh, you connect two uh, group elements, two integers, if they differ by one. Okay, so this gives us this uh, phi infinite line. Okay, as the Cayley graph, and the word metric is just the standard Euclidean metric on the on the integers. On the other hand, if you pick a generating set with uh, two generators, one and two, you get a different graph, which is. Uh, somewhat related to it, you can see sort of if you squint with your eyes, then this will sort of get flatter and flatter and eventually you'll just see a line. Or if you retreat from the image, it, it will sort of blur and become a thick line here. Yeah? And in fact, if you look at two, the two metrics, they are by Lipschitz equivalent. One is larger than the other and the other uh, and is bounded by a factor of two. All right, so if you uh, can abstract from this, these small differences, then you do have sort of uh, some geometry that's defined up to this uh, whatever equivalence that you have of these uh, metrics. And that's of course inherent to the group. That's the main uh, observation of the sort of fundamental observation in the geometric group theory that uh, then try to investigate the properties of groups that can be defined in terms of the word matrix, but without committing to a specific choice of generating set. Okay, so what are the properties that are sort of uh, can be formulated in terms of the word matrix, but independent uh, of it up to quasi isometry Okay, that's the simplest case. Um, if you take other topological algebraic objects, so you add some topology to it, for example, a Banach space, well, uh, they have also been submitted to uh, similar nonlinear geometric investigations, and there's been clear and deep parallels between the nonlinear geometry of, uh, of Banach spaces and, and geometric group theory. Okay. Namely, if you start out with a Banach space, so this is a completely uh, complete norm space, well, you can strip away in layers of structures of this Banach space and view the Banach space in various categories. Well, if you strip away the norm, but you retain and the algebraic structure, but you retain the, the metric, well, then you get a metric space. You can strip away the specific metric and uh, consider it's by Lipschitz equivalence class and you get sort of the Lipschitz geometry of the space, which is another uh, important uh, object of investigation. Furthermore, you can, you can strip away the, the by Lipschitz equivalence class and just look at the uniform space or even the quasi-metric space that you get um, from this. Okay, now as a consequence of the work I'm talking about, 
essentially the nonlinear geometry of Banach spaces and geometric group theory, there are in fact nothing but two instances of the same overarching framework. Um, so this is not the main point here, but to say that this framework sort of uh, unifies various different uh, studies that were performed in the past and still are very active. Okay, now Banach spaces have obvious geometry, okay? but if you uh, pass to a topological group, which is a more abstract object, so these are not a priori equipped with any geometric structure. Okay? It's just an algebraic topological object that has topology and some algebra. Okay? So now the examples that uh, I'm interested in here um, come from uh, various branches of mathematics. So many of them are topological transformation groups, such as uh, homeomorphism groups or diffeomorphism groups of uh, manifolds. Okay, with, you can vary the regularity of the men of the diffeomorphisms and get different types of groups, etc. Or uh, in a, a case which is familiar from uh, model theory, if you take some countable discrete combinatorial object, a model theoretical object, you can look at its group of automorphisms. Now, these groups of automorphisms, they may sound like these are very specific objects that only appear in model theory or maybe graph theory or something, infinite graph theory. But in fact, they are also uh, becoming more and more important in topology because these appear as uh, mapping class groups of infinite type surfaces. For example, if you take an infinite type surface, you can, uh, in many cases, uh, if you look at its mapping class groups. So these are the, the, the classes of uh, homeomorphisms of the surface that uh, homotopy types of, uh, of uh, homeomorphisms. Okay, And uh, in this particular example that I've drawn here, so this is an infinite genus uh, non-compact surface, you can look at uh, the curve graph which is just you take the simple closed curves and you, uh, so these are your basic objects and then you uh, put a graph on them by saying two of them are related by an edge if they have disjoint realizations. Or you can look at the opposite that if all the, uh, yeah, well, anyway, but let's just say disjoint realizations, then you connect them by an edge, okay? And it turns out that the, mapping class group is just the automorphism group of this uh, curve graph. Okay. So that's another way of uh, bringing about these uh, automorphism groups and uh, this points to their importance. All right. Well, so given some topological group, often a transformation group, is a canonical way of seeing this as a geometric object, as in the case of uh, finitely generated groups. Well, for some, it is. There, there is such a way. Okay, if you, for example, if you take a Lie group, or a, a more generally a, a locally compact group, which is generated by a compact subset. Well, then the short argument shows that up to quasi isometry, if you take the word metric associated with this. Uh, now compact generating set, this is again independent of the choice of, uh, of, the, gener of the compact generating set. Again, up to quasi asymmetry. Well, so this setup, for example, is a subject of a recent monograph by Yves de Cornulier and Pierre de Larat. Um, but once a group is no longer compact, compactly generated, there's no obvious substitute for this. And so you have to find some other approach uh, if possible. Well, so we won't be needing this, but let me just uh, briefly recap the definition of uniform spaces because uh, the objects that we're studying will eventually be some type of uh, analog and 
at infinity of uniform spaces. Okay, so recall that if you have a set uh, X, then a uniform structure on the set of, uh, it's a filter on subsets of X cross X. So these are uh, subsets of the, of the square. And this filter of sets, well, every element uh, of the filter contains the diagonal uh, of X and it's closed under uh, uh, symmetries. Okay, so if you flip the coordinates and it has this additional property that uh, it's, there's sort of the square root for every element. If you have an element D, then you can find an F whose composition here yeah, is a subset of E. Okay, well, the canonical example of a uniform space is uh, of course, when you have a metric space or more generally a pseudo metric space. So maybe where you can have distance zero between uh, distinct points. And then for every uh, positive alpha, you can take the subset of X cross X, which consists of the pairs X and Y whose distance are less than alpha. You get sort of a neighborhood of uh, the diagonal in, uh, in X. And then you define a uniformity on, uh, on X by simply taking F, all sets E that contain one of these uh, E alphas. Okay, for a positive alpha. All right, so this is how uh, uniformities come about. So now we'll see that there's another way of, uh, of defining interesting objects, in interesting structures uh, from uh, metrics. This comes from, uh, this, the definition here is due to John Rowe. It's the notion of uh, coarse spaces. Okay, so if you have a, a set X, now a coarse structure on X is an ideal of subsets of uh, X cross X. Okay, so as before, now with, a few different properties. So first of all, as opposed to uh, the uniformities were filters, a core structure is an ideal. So it's sort of the dual notion of, of the filter. And in this case, we demand that the diagonal belongs to the, uh, the ideal and uh, it's closed under uh, symmetries and uh, compositions. Okay. So if you start out with the pseudometric space, again, you can get a canonical core structure associated with it, namely by taking the subset of, e, uh, of X plus X that are contained in some E alpha, where now you demand that uh, alpha is uh, finite. So for a uniform structure, essentially you are interested in E alphas where alpha is small, but strictly positive. Whereas for a core structure, you're really interested in large alphas, but that remain finite. Okay. So one defines an, a, uh, a filter and the other defines an ideal. Okay, so that's an abstract notion. It's a, it's a bit hard to grasp, but there's some similarity with, with uniform structures that are it's worth pointing out, okay? For example, if you have a topological group, then you always get a left uniform structure. Uh, you get a uniform structure on the group by defining uh, these sets EV that are given as, uh, um, well, you fix an identity neighborhood in the group, and then you look at elements uh, or pairs G comma F so that their difference is uh, belongs to this uh, identity neighborhood. So elements that are close to each other. Okay. And so then there's a classical characterization of this, uh, which says that the left uniform structure on, on any topological group, or at least on a house top topo topological group is given by the union of all uh, uniformities given by these, um, by left invariance continuous pseudometrics on the group. Okay, don't have to worry too much about this, but uh, the main thing is that you can express this uh, uniformity 
as a union of metric uniformities. Okay, given by left invariant continuous pseudometrics. Now, we'll take this theorem and dualize it. And if you dualize the theorem, you get the definition. If you dualize uh, other things, then uh, you should essentially just place negations and strategically to get the good concept. Okay, so let's start out with the topological group. And then you define its left core structure as the intersection in this case, as all, of all the core structures associated with continuous left invariant pseudometrics on the group. All right, well, all this is abstract, uh, sort of general, of general topological uh, nonsense. So really to see that this makes any sense and this is a useful notion, we should try to have a better grasp of, uh, of this structure uh, in order to do analysis uh, of the associated objects. Okay, so the first thing to do is well, associate an ideal of small sets with uh, this structure. Okay, so let me in the future just assume that you're dealing with uh, sort of nicer topological groups and not sort of completely abstract uh, groups. So these are the Polish groups that I'm uh, mainly interested in. So these are just the Polish spaces, or the topological groups that happen to be Polish spaces. So these are separable and completely metrizable groups. Okay, so the metric is not part of uh, the given, it's just a topological group with which, so that the top, topology is given by some uh, complete metric and uh, well, but it's, uh, it's separable. Okay, so let's fix a subset of it. And then the following conditions are equivalent. Well, so there's this notion of boundedness in the core structure. So this is an, uh, an abstract definition here that the, the square is, uh, is in the core structure. The main thing here is that this is defined directly in terms of the core structure. So nothing else is needed. This is the same as demanding that this set A has always always has finite diameter uh, with respect to any uh, left invariant pseudometric of the group. Or if you wish, if you're familiar with length, length functions, this is just that it has a, it has a finite length in any uh, continuous uh, length function of the group. More concretely, you have the sort of an algebraic, char algebraic topological characterization of it, which is more useful in, uh, in practice. Namely that whenever you fix an identity neighborhood, you can find some finite set and a power so that A is contained in this uh, finite product of, uh, of this identity neighborhood and these uh, finitely many elements. And so that's really the operative uh, definition that you have. Well, okay, so this gives uh, us a bit more hold on things. Well, in countable discrete or locally compact sigma compact groups, the, the bounded sets are simply the, the finite sets, respectively the, the relatively compact sets. So these are just uh, the sets you would expect to be small in, in these topological groups. Similarly, if you uh, start out with the Banach space uh, and you forget all about the uh, linear structure, but you only retain the, topo the topology and, and the addition, well, then you get an additive uh, topological group. The bounded sets in here are exactly the non-bounded sets. So this is nothing else than what you'd expect. Again, it still remains somewhat uh, complicated, so let's, look at uh, metrizability. You'd like to just have this core structure be simply given by some uh, metric on the group. Okay. And for our Polish group, uh, metrizability of the core structure, meaning that it's the core structure associated to some pseudometric is the same as 
it being a, uh, the metric, uh, the cross structure associated to some continuous left invariant metric on, on G. And again, we have an operative uh, verification of this, namely that the group is locally bounded, meaning that it has some identity neighborhood which is bounded. So for example, if you have a locally compact group, well, locally compact means that it has a, a compact identity neighborhood and compact is automatically bounded. So these are the locally bounded groups. Well, these are locally bounded, meaning that the associated core structure is metricity. All right, but in fact, what is the core structure? Well, it's simply whatever uh, remains from uh, the, the any, any choice of a proper left invariant metric on the group. So uh, left invariant metric whose uh, balls are, are compact, closed balls are compact. And if you have a Banach space, well, then the core structure of the top associated topological group is simply that induced by the norm metric. Okay, so this brings us into some more familiar territory where you can understand uh, the objects that you're dealing with. And in fact, so now we have some structure, but I say it's a core structure, but in order to understand any structure, you also need to know what the, the morphisms associated with the structure is. Okay, so in the case of, uh, of groups with the metricable core structure, the course morphisms are easily described. Okay. Namely, you have a map from one group to the other, then it's a morphism in the course category or what is termed a bonologous map. If, well, the distance between two images with respect to uh, the metric inducing the course structure on H is bounded by some function of the distance uh, between the pre-images in G, okay? Just for some monotone function uh, theta, this uh, inequality holds for all X and Y, okay? And once you have the morphism, you, know, you should know what the isomorphisms are, that they are defined uh, in a similar way to homotopy equivalence and course equivalence is is that you then have a pair of bonologous maps so that the compositions in the two directions, they don't uh, move things too much. So another way, if I look at the, uh, the supremum of our elements of G of the distance from X to uh, Psi of phi of X, this is uh, bounded and similar the other way around. Well, again, this is simply uh, the notion of quasi-isometry in a slightly broader framework. Okay, so if you're uh, primarily interested in uh, finite degenerated groups, this would just be quasi-isometry. Anyway, so we now have some metricable structure and associated maps, and this is the, the amount of geometry that uh, that one can introduce on, on these more general topological groups. So from finitely generated groups to local compact uh, groups to Banach spaces and uh, to a much larger set. Okay, so let's take some examples that are not covered by those previous uh, cases. Well, one group that will be important in the following is uh, the group of homeomorphisms of the real line, but not all homeomorphisms, only those that commute with integral translations. So they sort of essentially move the uh, unit interval around, makes a homeomorphism of it, and then replicates it in all other uh, un uh, unit intervals, all successive uh, integral translates of that. Okay. Alternatively, in this uh, sort of shows it's important. It, this is the group of all lifts of orientation preserving homeomorphisms of the unit circle to the real line. Okay, so if you take an orientation preserving homeomorphism of, of the circle, you can lift it in 
and in infinitely many ways to a homeomorphism of the real line. And in this way, you, you get this group here, the middle term as a central extension of the, home, uh, of the group of orientation preserving homeomorphisms of the circle by uh, the group of integers. And so this is, of course, interesting in topology. And in fact, so there is uh, a geometry on that. And the group turns out to be coarsely equivalent with the real line itself, simply by taking uh, the evaluation map at some particular point, say, at zero. Okay? So you take a homeomorphism yeah, that commutes with integral translations, and you evaluate it at zero. And that mapping establishes a coarse equivalence between uh, this group and the real line. For another example, uh, consider the regular tree of uh, countable infinite valence and let uh, order of uh, T infinity denote its uh, group of automorphisms. Okay, so alternatively, so this is the isometry group of this tree where it's given the shortest path distance. Okay, so here, the bad picture of it. Well, you just take a a tree that splits infinitely in every node, countably infinite, infinitely in every node. And then you look at the group of all uh, uh, automorphisms of this tree. Okay. And it's clear that the tree itself, well, that is a metric space by just looking at distances, the shortest path distances. And in fact, the group itself, the automorphism group uh, of the tree is quasi, uh, is a uh, course closely equivalent with uh, this tree via the evaluation map, again, where you just fix some root in the tree and then you evaluate uh, the automorphisms on, on this. And so in the previous two examples, you had abstract uh, topological groups. They were uh, topological transformation groups, but you forgot about the phase space they were operating on. You, forget about their structure as permutation groups, and you only remember their, uh, them as topological groups, but still from that, you get some rigidity because you can reconstruct uh, the object they were acting on, the phase space, up to, quasi, uh, up to course equivalence or quasi-isometry from uh, the topological group, just by, in fact, it's coarsely equivalent. Okay, so that gives you some amount of rigidity of uh, these objects. Uh, Christian, was it a rooted tree? Like you take the odd, like is, is the root fixed by automorphisms? No, it's the unrooted tree. If you fix the root, okay. then you get a much- uh, Yeah, I mean, you, you get, get a trivial, trivial group. Yeah, trivial, yeah. yeah. Okay, my picture here is not, uh, might indicate that there's a root, but this is not. You just choose a root and then you evaluate it. Okay. okay, now that's all the abstract setting. Now this has really been a warm up for, uh, for what I wanna talk about, which is um, a specific class of groups that uh, come about in a very interesting way. Okay, so the main inspiration uh, for, for this class of groups that I will talk about now, namely bounded geometry, is a seminal result due to Kromov uh, that connects geometric group theory with topological dynamics. Okay, so, so Kromov uh, established this in, uh, early on in his work on geometric group theory. And so let me just formulate it here in, in the setting that uh, he considered, namely you take two finitely generated groups Okay. And then you have their geometries from the word matrix. So these groups are coarsely equivalent. So some geometric type of equivalence, if and only if they admit some type of dynamical coupling. So a, a topological coupling. Okay. So what is this? So it's two actions of 
G and of H commuting actions on the same space on a locally compact Hausdorff space. So I've got two continuous actions of G and H, they commute. So we can think of it as a, an action of the product group G times H. They're continuous, they're proper and they're co-compact. I'll say what these words mean, but once you have such a coupling, then you, you get a coarse equivalence. And on the other hand, from a coarse equivalence, you also get a topological coupling. So let me say that coarse equivalences are in general, well, these are bet between two discrete objects that coarse equivalences don't have to be uh, continuous in any reasonable way. Uh, of course, between discrete objects, that doesn't make much sense, but they don't even have to be uh, bijections. So these are somehow wild maps that get regularized to become uh, continuous commuting actions. Okay, so let's review some of these uh, dynamical notions and I'll generalize them a bit to uh, fit our setting. Okay, so you start out with a continuous action of a topological group G on some locally compact space. So co-compactness is the easiest notion to understand. This is simply that you have a compact fundamental domain for the action, which means that you can, you know, there's some compact set so that uh, uh, all orbits intersect this compact set. And when you move this compact set around, you get some uh, covering of the, of the local compact space. Course properness is slightly different. So uh, different. This means that if you fix a compact set, then the set of elements in the group that don't move this compact set entirely away from itself, this is bounded. Okay, so it's a small set in the group. Okay, if you had a local compact group, uh, this, since boundedness is just relatively compactness, this is exactly properness of the action. But this also, this definition also makes sense for more general topological groups. And modesty is a, a third notion, which means that if I take a bounded set in the group and a compact set in the phase space, well, then uh, the sort of the partial orbit here of every element of the union of partial orbits of elements in K is a relatively compact set in, in uh, X. Okay, so it's not too large. Now, again, if uh, G is locally compact, sigma compact, bounded and relatively compact sets coincide. So modest here, if I take a, a relatively compact set and a compact set here and I multiply them together, this is still a relatively compact. So in this case, uh, every continuous action is modest. Okay, so it's not really a restriction in the local and compact case. Now, why do we go through all of this? Well, if you just stick to uh, the class of modest continuous actions. So these are actions that don't blow up a, a, a compact set to be humongous uh, under the group action. So there's some restriction on, on, on the uh, topological dynamics. Well then coarse properness, this simply corresponds to a faithful representation of the coarse structure in the following sense. Okay, so you fix a modest continuous action of some topological group on a local compact space. In our case, again, if it's locally compact, you can just forget about modesty because it's automatic. Okay. And then course properness of the action is equivalent to uh, uh, this faithful representation of the course structure in the sense that when you vary uh, K over compact subsets, and you look at these entourages, so these uh, subsets of, X, of G cross G, where GK times FK, they intersect. Well, these sets, they form a basis for the core structure on G. Okay, so you completely uh, obtain, you can completely read off the core structure on G from every course, uh, coarsely proper action and vice versa. If you have an action where you can read off the the this uh, 
the cost structure, then it's because it's costly property. Okay, so this shows that this is a very natural notion for uh, such uh, actions. Okay. Co-compactness, on the other hand, this becomes now an, a restrictive uh, structural condition on the group. Okay, so now you start out with a modest and costly proper continuous action on a locally compact space. And let's assume it also has a dense orbit. Okay. You can always take an orbit and take its closure and, and look at restrict your attention to that. That won't change modesty nor course properness. Okay. So you've got this uh, sort of coarsely faithful action on a locally compact space. Well, then co-compactness is equivalent to the group having bounded geometry, which is a slightly, uh, uh, there's an algebraic definition of this uh, in the following sense. Okay, so what does it mean to have bounded geometry? It means that you can find some bounded set in the group that can cover every other bounded set via finitely many translates. And so there's some set which is small, but still large enough that it can cover every other small set by finitely many left translates. Okay, so that shows that this uh, class of groups is of course uh, uh, interesting. And it also shows that if you want to extend the equivalence that's given by uh, Holmhoff's theorem, you're not going to be able to go beyond the class of groups with bounded geometry because those actions were co compact. So you can't, it doesn't even, the Holmhoff's theorem would not make sense beyond this uh, class of groups. There's no way of getting of, uh, groups without bounded geometry to act in, in this nice way on locally compact spaces. Okay, well, luckily these uh, groups of bounded geometry, they, if you restrict to Polish groups, they have uh, some relatively nice structure, a uh, core structure, in particular it's metrizable. Okay. And in fact, you get uh, a nice uh, characterization of bounded geometry in terms of uh, algebra or geometry, or dynamics. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so bounded geometry, this was this algebraic condition of covering uh, certain sets by finitely many left translates, which is the algebraic condition. Well, this is equivalent to be, uh, to the group being coarsely equivalent to a proper metric space. So a metric space whose balls are, uh, whose closed balls are compact, okay? And again, it's also equivalent to the dynamical uh, condition that the group itself admits a coarsely proper, modest and co-compact continuous action on some locally compact house top space. Essentially what I said previously uh, shows, uh, implies that three gives you one, but it's really the construction of this action from uh, bounded geometry, which is uh, which is the non-trivial uh, part of the affair. Okay, and let me just briefly go through this. I would like to point out that uh, this uses some interesting work of uh, Joseph Zielinski on uh, on the structure of locally Holke precompact groups, in particular class of uh, groups um, that I won't go into here, but what you do is you take every, uh, you take this group G that you start out with and you embed it into some other Polish group in a way that preserves its, uh, its core structure. And this now ambient group is a nice group and it has a local, uh, locally compact uh, compactification. So it's the isometry group of the Eurison metric space for those of you that know. Okay. And if you take this, uh, it has a local compactification by uh, this work of Zielinski. And in fact, the action now, G sits as a subgroup inside of, of the group here. So it acts on the 
this local compactification in a way that's costly, proper, and modest. And if you just restrict uh, the attention to a, some the closure of a of an orbit, well, then you get uh, a co-compact action exactly when the group has bounded geometry. Well, okay, that was a brief description of it, but um, this now can bring us back to uh, Kolmov's uh, theorem, and let's look at the setup again. So extending uh, the setup of Kolmov to now all topological groups, we say that if you have two commuting continuous actions on locally compact space, they form a topological uh, coupling exactly when they are coarsely proper, modest, and co-compact. So we have these three uh, dynamical criteria that uh, we showed how they, uh, they came about. And so this is, they have, so really you have commuting actions on the same locally compact space that both are uh, faithful for their for their course, for their course uh, structure. Okay, now suppose you start out with discrete groups, G and H. Well, they have these groups, they will have commuting continuous actions on the space of all functions from G to H. Okay, so you just look at H to the power of G, which is the set of functions from uh, G to H. And then you, of course, G and H both act on this space by post and pre-composition uh, respectively. All right, uh, now this, this space is in general not uh, local compact, but if you take, if you start out with a specific function, a course equivalence, and then you take its orbits and its closure, this does uh, become a locally compact space and uh, the actions of G and H on it will be uh, proper and co-compact. So this is it. It's essentially the proof of, uh, of Kolmov and establishes or at least one direction, the non-trivial direction of uh, Kolmov's theorem. Okay, so starting out from some, uh, some course equivalence, you get this topological coupling via uh, this construction. Now, already for locally compact groups, this doesn't work. Well, so the immediate problem is that if I have these two actions uh, and I do the same, but now when G and H are, are locally compact and no longer discrete, well, the actions, are far from being continuous, proper, and co-compact, unless the course equivalence is uniformly continuous. Now, it's easy to construct uh, course equivalences between groups that where the pair admits no uniformly continuous course equivalence. So you can't always uh, get this phi to be uniformly continuous. Nevertheless, uh, in work with uh, Uri Bada, we showed that you can get around this problem by you, you replace uh, this phi by a uniformly continuous map that maps into no longer the group H, but into the Banach space L1 of H. If it's a local compact group, you can consider this, uh, this function space, and then you can get a, a coupling in, in inside of this now uh, larger space. Okay, so you get now uh, Kolmov's theorem for uh, pairs of locally compact in these second countable groups. Okay, so they're coarsely equivalent if and only if they admit a topological coupling. Okay, now you do get a full generalization of Kolmov's criterion in the largest possible setting, at least within the class of Polish groups. Okay, so those are bounded geometry. Okay, so if you take Polish groups of bounded geometry, you get a course equivalence if and only if uh, they admit a topological coupling. Okay, and I won't go into the, the setup for this. Um, I don't have time to 
in that. But let me just mention uh, sort of the, the canonical example that sort of motivates uh, uh, this to begin with, namely, well, the, the, the coupling of whatever quality it is between the group of integers acting by translation on the real line and this group of homeomorphisms of the real line commuting with integral translations. Okay, so by definition, these tautological actions are the tautological action of this group, the evaluation action simply on this group on the real line and the translation action here, they commute. This is exactly the definition of what this group is. And it is in fact the topological coupling of these two groups of uh, bounded geometry, uh, the integers and this homeomorphism group. Okay, so, uh, and you can, of course, uh, construct other examples, but it shows that this, uh, the basic framework exists and makes sense uh, beyond the class of local compact group, uh, local compact groups. All right, so let me just, uh, let me finish with this and uh, here's a, some references uh, for those that are interested. Thanks, Christian. Uh, are there any questions for Christian? Uh, oh, I got. A, I just got a message that this session is scheduled to end in one minute ago. Yeah, please extend for a couple of minutes just for questions. Oh, I had one question. Uh, it's unrelated to your work in the end, but for me to understand this uniform, uh, not uniformities, but course structure. You had some equivalences for a Polish group uh, about the course structure. So like A was in the this course structure, if and only if uh, there yeah. was some finite set K such that, where do you get finiteness uh, in such a non-compact setting? Well, uh, okay, so. Yeah, sorry, it was way before, like in the beginning. Okay, it was here. Here's the thing, yeah? Yeah, F, the F. Well, right? that has to do with the uh, sort of delicate constructions of metrics on groups. That's really the, the idea here, that, um, well, if you have, if you had, some, if you had a coarsely bounded set, mm -hmm. uh, some bounded set, so one that satisfied this condition two, easily equivalent to, uh, to one, mm -hmm. but it failed condition three, then from this identity neighborhood V in condition three, you construct some metric that contradicts condition two. So this. Oh. This is guess, through uh, some variant of uh, the birkhoff kakutani I see. So you get so, something similar to compactness by taking intersection over all uh, pseudo metrics uh, yes. on the group. I see. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions for Christian? Okay. Then, if not, let's thank him for a wonderful talk. Uh, our next speaker is Dana Bartoshova, but we have to switch uh, the Zoom meeting. So uh, I'll see you in the next meeting.